Thank you, Christine. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Dave Diefler. And I have to tell you that Dave is one of the smartest people I know. <laughs> I'm not going to live up to that. <laughs> Today, he will be discussing some of the resources that we're going to find on the moon and how we will benefit from them. And it's just a follow-up to the previous talk, and away we go. Mr. Dave Diesler. Okay, like Judy said, is this working? Yeah, I knew it was something. Okay, is it working now? Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about mining the moon. Uh, Peter gave us a lot of good reasons about why to mine the moon. I'm going to talk a little more about how to mine the moon. Um, we've got the solar power satellites, space colonies maybe to house the workers, but there's also the possibility of mining helium-3 on the moon. Stuff's only present in parts per billion, but it could be economical to mine it. However, 50 years ago they said we'd have fusion in 50 years, and now they're saying in 50 years we're going to have fusion. We don't know if there's ever going to be fusion. And even if we get deuterium-tritium fusion that they're working on now, it gives off a lot of neutrons, high-energy neutrons. That could cause the reactor to become radioactive, so I don't know if that's so good. Helium-3 fusion doesn't give off all these neutrons. And besides, you get to mine it in space, so I like helium-3 mining. <laughs> okay, at first we're gonna have to bring everything from Earth. Oxygen, water, food, fuel, machinery, vehicles, habitats, spacesuits, medicines, computers, sundry items, it's all gonna have to be shipped up there. And it's all gonna cost thousands of dollars per pound. We won't have to bring up heavy radiation shielding. I think NASA's only talking about keeping astronauts up there for about two weeks at a time, so their radiation exposure won't be too great. But if workers are gonna stay on the moon for months, even years, they're gonna need about six meters of regolith covering their habitat to uh, block out cosmic rays, and that'll also provide thermal insulation from the extremes of lunar temperatures and micrometeoroid protection. So, plain old moon dust is good for that. And eventually, we're gonna have to make use of lunar resources to make everything we can on the moon. The moon has a number of resources that we can take advantage of. Reliable ener solar energy 50% of the time, 70 to 80% of the time near the polar regions. We've got free vacuum, low gravity, so the uh, machines don't have to lift too much weight. Extreme cold using shadowed space radiators, that's gonna be important for like making liquid oxygen. The polar ices, which may contain oxides of carbon and ammonia too, if it's of cometary origin. And ammonia would be a source of nitrogen as well as fertilizer. Of course, the regolith is the big resource, the moon dust, the lunar soil, whatever you want to call it. And there could be undiscovered ores of magmatic and volcanic origin. That's a big if. We don't know anything about that until we do more exploration. This use of local resources to supply and build up a space base is called ISRU. That stands for In Situ Resource Utilization. You know, like, the pioneers didn't take everything they needed with them. They lived off the land. That's what we're going to have to do in space. Lunar soil is over 40% oxygen. We need that for breathing, obviously, but also for rocket propellant. If we use hydrogen and oxygen, anywhere from six to eight weights of oxygen is needed for every weight of hydrogen. Over 20% silicon for making solar panels on the moon and in outer space in giant solar power satellites. Iron, P 
Pure iron is not a particularly strong metal, but you can combine it with a little bit of carbon and make steel, which is very strong. The kind of iron you come in contact with on Earth is usually cast iron, which is about 3.5% carbon. Uh, the moon, we're going to get pure iron. But you can still use that for pots and pans, uh, maybe water pipes, though there are better materials, um, door hinges, hardware parts of different kinds for use indoors. You really wouldn't want to use iron outside in the vacuum because at night it gets so cold it would become really brittle. Calcium, well, calcium is interesting because calcium is a better conductor than copper, but we don't use it on Earth because it reacts with air and moisture. It can ignite spontaneously. In the vacuum of the moon, we won't have that problem. So some thinkers have proposed using calcium wires and cables for a power transmission on the moon. And then there's aluminum, which we use for almost everything. We'll need aluminum for spacecraft, ground vehicles made on the moon, mining machines made on the moon. There's almost as much magnesium as there is aluminum. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. The 3% other is mostly titanium, manganese, and chromium, which are good for alloying steel. Uh, sodium, potassium, and phosphorus, which are useful for fertilizer, and really tiny traces of other things. Like there's only like 12 parts per million copper, so that's not something we're going to go after. We've got to dig the regolith up. This is how we think we're going to do it. This is called a slusher. It just pulls the bucket out and then pulls it in and scrapes up the dirt. Uh, the side view will help you see how it operates better. It's a pretty simple machine. Won't be too hard to build on the moon, though the first one will have to be shipped up there just so we can get some regolith to make something. So once we've got some regolith, we want to get something out of it. And oxygen is probably the first thing we'll go for. What this is, is a magma electrolysis cell. It runs an electric current through some regolith, and that heats it up and melts it, and then it splits the regolith up, just like uh, electricity going through water and splitting it up into hydrogen and oxygen. In this case, it splits the compounds in the regolith up into oxygen, and uh, iron silicon alloy and slag that they can make ceramic bricks out of. This is a simple one-step method for producing a lot of oxygen on the moon. So it might be used very early on. Now this monstrosity is a, pro is a chemical process for extracting all the metals out of regolith that was devised in 1980 by NASA's Advanced Automation for Space Mission study. And I can barely read the fine print here, but I think it says there's going to be, it would have like 34 pieces of equipment like precipitator, drying kiln, fractional, fractionalization tower, and 111 nodes which are points where the pipes meet together and each node requires a valve and a valve operating mechanism. So <clears throat> it's a real complex process. Also, it requires imported chemicals like hydrofluoric acid that are not present on the moon. So all these chemicals would have to be brought in and recycled, replenished every now and then. And there's a lot of corrosion involved. Anyhow, I don't like that, but I do like Dr. Schubert's supersonic dust roaster. <laughs> it's about a thousand times simpler than anything else they've come up with. I was hoping Dr. Schubert would talk a little bit about it, but uh, you see where it says load fines, that's where you pour the regolith in, and then it melts it and the streamers of regolith go down through a thorium oxide tube and a radio Radio frequency coils get the stuff super hot and it disassociates. The oxygen comes out through uh, 
the supersonic nozzle that comes out of the gas expansion collection bell, and the condensed particles go zooming through and get separated by the all isotope separator, isotope separation again, that basically works on the same principle as a mass spectrometer. So this process doesn't require any chemicals, and that helps a lot. And you just load it up and let it rip. That other process, seems like there's a lot of stopping points and equipment that has to be broken down and reserviced and would just be terrible. Now, the supersonic dust roaster produces a slag of calcium oxide and magnesium oxide, and we can make use of that. You can take a mixture of calcium oxide and magnesium oxide and throw it in a furnace like this, along with some silicon. And we can either get silicon from the separator, or we can just use uh, iron silicon from a magma electrolysis cell. You heat it up to about 1,200 degrees Celsius under reduced pressure. And since vacuum is free on the moon, we don't need any kind of powerful pump or compressor to reduce the pressure. And the silicon reacts with the, ox the, the oxygen and the magnesium oxide, and magnesium boils out. The magnesium vapor is condensed, and uh, voila, we have magnesium. The slag that's left over could just be cast into bricks and blocks and used for construction. Now magnesium, it's kind of an underrated metal. It's lightweight and fairly strong, and it's the third most used construction metal after iron and aluminum. It could be useful for spacecraft and ground vehicles built on the moon. It can make aluminum alloys harder and stronger. In fact, that's its main use on Earth, the alloying of aluminum. It's highly reflective. Sheets or foils could be made for solar furnace reflectors. Magnesium powder can be mixed with locks and the slurry poured in a tank, detonated with an electric spark, and that'll make an explosive for blasting into rock. You don't have enough nitrogen on the moon to make uh, dynamite or TNT. Um, they do this on Earth. They usually use <coughs> aluminum powder, but I think aluminum will have too much value to be used as an explosive. Magnesium oxide makes a high temperature fire brick that you can line furnaces to produce iron steel, cement, glass, etc. And, mag it's a, and magnesium is essential for human, animal, and plant nutrition, and magnesium salts have medical uses. Since there's almost as much magnesium as aluminum, it seems moon miners should make use of it any way they can. Now, there's another resource on the moon that's easy to get and very interesting. Uh, it comes from the seas of the moon, the mare. The mare regolith is basaltic. That just means it's uh, solidified lava. It consists mostly of iron and magnesium silicates and some titanium oxides. The highland regolith is a north acidic it's richer in calcium and aluminum silicates. Now, the nice thing about the mare regolith is that you can dig it up, you can melt it, you can cast it, and make all kinds of things out of it. Can you, can you see those? I hope so. Uh, you can cast basalt molds to make uh, machine-based supports, tool beds, conveyors, uh, conveyors and things like uh, big funnels that we're going to pour regolith through to feed it into a furnace or a separator or a processor of any kind. Regolith is really abrasive. The particles have very sharp edges because they've never been exposed to wind or water erosion. But this basalt is actually more abrasion resistant than steel. So all kinds of uh, mining and processing equipment that's got to handle regolith could be lined with cast basalt. You can make tiles out of it, maybe an ablative heat shield material. 
railroad ties, pylons, heavy duty containers for agricultural use, all kinds of structures like supports for solar reflectors, radar dishes, whatever. The sintered basalt is a little different. They pack the basalt in an iron mold and then just heat it enough for the edges of the particles to fuse together. It doesn't require a full melting, so it uses less energy. And spun basalt, you can actually draw the molten basalt into a fiber and make all kinds of things like cloth and bedding. You can make protective outerwear out of it if you weave it because uh, the stuff resists acid, it resists bases, and uh, it's fireproof. Anyhow, this list of applications came from NASA's Advanced Automation for Space Missions. Here are some items made out of cast basalt. There is a company in Yugoslavia called Petrugia that makes all kinds of things out of basalt. A bathtub, of course. You could also cultivate shrimp and fish in a tub. Uh, hand basin made out of basalt. Some nice things, maybe for the steps of the library. Maybe they're just... <laughs> Maybe they're just paperweights, I don't know. A lamp. I think these are actually carved, these Egyptian scarabs. Here's how you make fibers out of it. You do it the same way you make glass fibers. You just melt the, melt the glass or melt the basalt. It goes through some bushings with tiny holes in them and continuous fillings drop out of there. And they'll either cool in the air or you can spray water on them and then they harden you just get a solid strand that you just roll it on up, cut it to any length, do what you want with it. This is a very crude diagram I made of actually printing up habitat. They do it on Earth with a process called contour crafting and they use, they use a big gantry and they use wet cement to print up houses. So I'm just suggesting taking basalt and melting it running it in a big 3D printer and printing up habitat layer by layer just the way they do with cement. Letting it harden and uh, it will be strong enough to hold air pressure. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about iron again. There is a resource in the regolith brought there by eons of meteoric bombardment. Uh, in, in the regolith all over the moon, a few tenths of a percent of it consists of iron and nickel particles from meteors. It's about five to 10% nickel. But these nickel particles are fused with silicates. And uh, Dr. William Augusto worked out a system where he grinds it, separates it magnetically, grinds it again, and gives it another magnetic separation. And uh, the result is a 99.5% pure feedstock of iron and nickel that would make excellent steel. The grinder is a centrifugal grinder. You can see where it goes into the rotor and that thing spins around and throws the particles against the impact block and it shatters the silicates. And that's how you purify those iron fines. Then you can take the iron fines, the powder, put them in a 3D printer, 3D printer and uh, print up all kinds of molds for casting basalt. You could, also, you could also cast very large parts with sand casting, but uh, with iron molds, we can use the molds over and over and over again while the 3D printer is busy working on something else. And it might even be possible to just run basalt straight through some kind of 3D, 3D printer to make various parts out of it. And, of course, we can get iron from the separator and powder that and use it, too. But that'll be pure iron without any uh, nickel in it. And we want that iron nickel because we want to make some good, strong steel parts. Now, you're never going to have roaring blast furnaces on the moon or uh, basic oxygen furnaces. You're never going to build a giant steel mill on the moon. There's just not enough carbon and not enough air. So. I propose the use of the ancient crucible steel process. This process is thousands of years old. You just basically take iron, mix it with carbon, 
get it red hot and keep it that way for several days and the carbon dissolves into the iron and converts it to steel. Uh, carbon is rare on the moon, but you only need a small amount of steel. Uh, so carbon is rare on the moon, but you only need a small amount of carbon to make a large amount of steel. Mild steel is about 0.3% carbon on up to like 1.5%. Uh, nickel improves its strength, makes it harder without making it more brittle. Manganese and chromium are useful alloy steel ingredients. Manganese makes steel harder, chromium makes stainless steel. We'll need steel for tools, ball bearings, manufacturing machines, knives, etc. but I doubt we're going to make bridges and skyscrapers with it, given the low amount of carbon on the moon. Steel can be sand cast, forged, rolled, extruded, cut, ground, welded more easily than titanium. And uh, a lot of people think everything we're going to do with, everything we would do with steel on Earth, we're going to do with titanium on the moon, but I kind of doubt that. Now this is a map of Shackleton Crater in uh, the South Polar region of the moon where NASA wants to land and build a base and go down into the crater to harvest ice. Uh, that's all very interesting and I'm sure the ice is a very great resource, but there's another resource that we have to keep in mind. And that's uh, solar wind implanted volatiles. The Earth's magnetic field protects us from the constant solar wind, but the moon has no magnetic field. So all kinds of elements are blown out in the solar wind and they deposit in the uh, regolith of the moon. Uh, scientists at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, have been designing various versions of their Mark II and Mark III miners. These are machines that go out, <coughs> probably by remote control, dig up some regolith, throw it in an onboard furnace, heat it up to about 700 Celsius to drive out helium-3 and other volatiles, <coughs> and then compress the gases and store them. They think they can mine a square kilometer to a depth of three meters every year. That would be about four and a half million tons of regolith they'd have to process. Uh, you'd only get about 33 kilograms of helium-3 from that. And we need about 30 tons to power the USA for a year. But you also get a bunch of other volatiles substantial quantities of water, nitrogen, CO2, hydrogen, normal helium-4, methane, carbon monoxide, and there's the helium-3, just 33 kilograms at the bottom. But you could get enough water to support over 750 inhabitants. You get 200 tons of hydrogen combined with 1,600 tons of oxygen, that's 1,800 tons of water, and I think an Olympic swimming pool has about 800 tons. 800 cubic meters of water in it. The uh, CO2, methane, and carbon monoxide has to be decomposed to get the carbon for making steel. Uh, methane can be decomposed with heat at 900 Celsius to get pure carbon and hydrogen. Then you recycle the hydrogen. The uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide can be reacted with hydrogen to make methane and water. And then you just thermally decompose the methane and you electrolyze the uh, water so you can recover the hydrogen and get a little extra oxygen that way. You would get about 82 tons of pure carbon per miner per year. That's enough to make 20, 27,000 tons of 0.3% carbon to mild steel. Now, I don't think we'd make that much steel because the crucible steel process uses a lot of energy and takes quite a bit of time. Also, we'd want some of that carbon for our uh, life support systems and farms. And 200 tons of hydrogen per miner, that can make 1,800 tons of water. Now, if we really were mining 30 tons of helium-3 on the moon every year, we'd be getting a thousand times as much. We'd be getting hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of tons 
of uh, volatiles. We'd need about a thousand mining machines to get 33 tons, and those would have to be built on the moon. I don't think we could ship all those mining machines to the moon. We'd have to use ISRU, bootstrap up a base, and build all these machines up there. And here's a better look at the machine. It's got a bucket wheel, loads things onto a conveyor and into the heater, and it just digs its way through. You can see. The little blue thing in the lower right corner is a six-foot-tall man to get an idea of how big this thing is. And that concludes our little foray into moon mining. I thank you. Wait a minute, I gotta keep this on. Yeah, I'll keep this on. So it, it's time for our question and answer period. Um, so it would be helpful if you could uh, repeat it so that the people who are watching can hear the question. Oh, okay. Repeat the question. Yeah, we're ready for the question and answer time. Right. right. So, so they got that. Okay. He heard it. All right. Um, well, uh, one of our Moon Society friends. Yes, Heckler. Uh, how about, Dave, if you go first, and you just want to call okay. the people then from yeah. here? All right. Yeah. Okay. And then for us, I can see all this. Yeah. Yeah. So let's hear from the lunatics, right? Dave, uh, rumor has it that uh, you and Dr. Schubert did some uh, tomfoolery with uh, storage of electricity. Yeah. Thomas Edison built a battery way back whenever consisting of iron and nickel electrodes in a solution of sodium hydroxide. And uh, we figured since there's all those meteoric iron and nickel particles on the moon, we could just run some of them through the separator and get some iron and nickel and cast them into electrodes, make some uh, battery vessels out of cast basalt, because uh, it, it'll resist very strong acid and basic solutions and put some water in there and some sodium to react it to make sodium hydroxide and in that way we'd have a very rugged battery. These iron nickel batteries aren't the most efficient but they're really rugged. Some of them have lasted 30 or 40 years. Uh, we wouldn't use them outside because you know, there's water in them and there's temperature extremes that you have to endure on the moon. We'd uh, build the batteries and keep them inside the habitat. They don't give off any dangerous gases or anything. Okay. And Bryce was next. Did Bryce? Okay, so how much surface area did you have to cover to get the carbon that you had cited? A square kilometer. One square kilometer. Okay, how much, how much surface area do you have to uh, dig through to get that much carbon? Yeah, one kilometer by one kilometer to a depth of three meters. And since regolith's about one and a half times as dense as water, you're talking about four and a half million tons of regolith. But the machine would be out there working constantly during the lunar day, digging its way across the uh, plains of the moon. And how much carbon did they produce? I calculate a total of 82 tons. Okay. Well, thank you. Jim? Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh. So let me summarize that question for the, for the mic. <laughs> yeah, you do it. And, and a summary of that question for the mic is, so if we're going to be building on the moon, you know, the moon has finite resources. Have we started thinking about um, the moon resources? And I imagine for all mankind might want to jump in on this conversation too. So the question was directed to both Dr. Schubert and Mr. Dietzler yeah. about what about these moon resources? Uh, my answer would be that, well, we mine about 9 billion tons of coal every year on Earth. 
you know, and I don't think we're going to have to mine that much to build solar power satellites. I think the resources of the moon should last for a good long time. They say there's about a thousand years worth of helium-3 on the moon, but we'd have to dig up the whole, all, the whole area of the seas of the moon. And that doesn't set too well with me. But give, let's say after a couple of hundred years of mining on the moon, we'd go on to the gas giant planets to get helium-3, if we ever get helium-3 fusion. Uh, and uh, there is one pollution problem that we have to be wary of. And in the process of smelting a lot of metals, a lot of oxygen is generated. And eventually, you could wind up with a thin atmosphere of oxygen on the moon that really wouldn't be all that desirable because the high vacuum is pretty useful. Yeah. Do you have anything to say? No. Okay. Uh, and, so I, would, I, would, I am curious if anybody else, because we have a lot of people here who are interested in the moon's surface for different reasons. So, Dr. Um, Dollar, Bryce. Uh, Michelle, does anybody want to jump in on that moon resource question? Uh, yes, sir. What are your first lines and uh, make up the different uh, resources that were available on the moon, different metals that you can find on the moon? How does that compare to what we have on the Earth? And, and I'm really looking for, we spend a lot of time on the Earth mining um, a rare Earth. Do you find any rare Earths at all on the moon? Yeah. They find rare earths in a mineral called creep. The K stands for potassium, the REE stands for rare earth elements, and the P stands for phosphorus. Um, it's kind of hard to describe where the creep is located. And it, it's, it's not a single mineral consisting of those elements. It also has silicon dioxide and aluminum oxide in it. It's a fairly typical moon rock but it's enriched in potassium, phosphorus, and rare earth elements. So it could be a source of those things. Yeah, I would just add, we, we study this stuff, and it's actually contained the rare earth elements in, in a phosphate mineral. Yeah. Two phosphate minerals, apatite and marilite. So, you, you, and you'll concentrate those with other processing. Yeah. Is, is the distribution about the same as we find on Earth, or in rare earth? No, it's, it's very much distributed. Not yeah, on the moon, everything's been exposed to eons of meteoric bombardment, so it's all pulverized and homogenized, and there never was any water, so there are no sedimentary rocks. Probably not. Yeah, a, a, a proposal I heard made once was, I don't know if you've ever heard of Peter Koch, editor of the Moon Miners Manifesto. He suggested forming something like a National Park Service of the Moon and taking certain areas and making them off limits to mining and stuff like that so we can preserve their beauty. Bob Perry. Bob Perry. Okay.
testing. Yep, there you go. Okay, so so who who has the floor <laughs> to ask the question? Is it? Wait, 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 Mike. Wait, wait. I'm trying to get to the mic to you. I'm trying. Do them on the far side. Yeah. yeah. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll just, for, well, one thing you can be happy about is the fact that we got to bury everything under about six meters of regolith. So act, an, an actual moon base for any long-term habitation would all be underground, and you, you wouldn't even notice it on the surface. You see some solar panels out there and some mounds. Yeah. I think Bob Perry had a question. Oh. oh, no, wait for the mic, because Bob's got the mic. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you mentioned the, uh, that Harvester would be working to a depth of three meters. Uh, the regolith has been churned for eons. Yeah. Uh, how typically deep does the regolith go before you get to hard rock? Uh, you know, that varies. I think it's deeper in the highland than in the Mara. I think it's only like 10 or 15 meters deep. And then you hit the uh, things called mega regolith, which is a north acidic material. Uh, the three meters, you got to realize that all that material's been churned up. The helium three is just hitting it on the surface, but the meteors churn everything up so much that it gets buried deeper. So it's in there in the top few meters. Mr. Heck? So I had a uh, comment about the uh, questions about conservation on the moon. Uh, you compare that to what's been done on the earth. Uh, you know, if you look at mining sites, there's large storage of, of cast offs from the mining process. A lot of it is very toxic. Uh, it's really nasty. Uh, it, on the moon, you wouldn't have those kinds of processes because you wouldn't use that much water. Like everything that has to do with mining always has to make a slurry. Well, you don't, can't do that because you don't have water. The other thing is, uh, you know, the Earth's habitat is uh, a huge uh, biosynergetic ecosystem where there's no eco up there. So you don't have to worry about cutting down <coughs> trees or messing up somebody's water or whatever. There's none of that up there. So it's like, you know, there's nothing living. So it's not like even, even in the desert where you have to worry about the great salamander lizard or some spotted owl or something. Unless there's moon men, then you have to worry. <laughs> But, um, so now that we have the mic, so what is there on the moon surface that we might want to, um, I know the mic isn't in the room, but it's for the people listening at home. So Michelle, tell us a little bit more about what we do want to save. Absolutely. So there are about 80, more than 80 human heritage sites on the moon, uh, sites where there are artifacts of human activity starting with Luna 2, the first hard landing on the moon, you know, all the way to Chang'e f or Chandrayaan, the Chinese and, and Indian rovers. Um, these are all sites that sh need, need to be cataloged. Um, and we're not, at For All Moonkind, we're not suggesting every single site needs to be a forbidden zone. We're suggesting that we need to figure out where everything is and decide what should be forbidden or what, what needs to be seen by archaeologists or, or protected until we have the technology to go back safely. I think there's a lot of people who would like to see exactly what happened at Tranquility Base, you know, the, the messages of peace where they tossed over Buzz Aldrin's shoulder or were they placed somewhere formally, you know, and is there really an art museum on the moon? Is that, did that piece of moon art, that ceramic tile really, is it really on the lander? So there's a lot of stuff that beyond the mining that we would like to see protected. I love this idea of a National Park Service on the moon. We, um, obviously we can't have any sort of national uh, rights on the moon and that's why we're working to create an international community that will look at exactly these issues and I will look at the Moon Mining Manifesto because that's, if we can get a universal park service that um, protects heritage sites and sites of natural beauty or sites that uh, should be preserved for some reason or other, I think that would be ideal and it would be a great way to get the inter international community together moving to the moon in unity. Yeah. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I talked a little bit on uh, back and forth in email with uh, Dr. Brad is the LRO and how that could help us. 
So you want to say a minute about LRO and how we, we can find those World Heritage Sites? I know that nobody can hear you. Sure. <laughs> um, the idea is that we can, we, we can and have imaged just about everything on the moon that, that was put there by humans. Um, with the exception of some of the earliest missions, like some of the lunar, Luna, uh, Russian, Soviet uh, impact, uh, hard landers, as you put them, um, and a few other things that we haven't found, but, but many of the objects have been found, so we know where they are. They've been imaged, um, and, it's a, and, and I agree, there's, a, I think, a, a strong sentiment to not mess with Whole moon. There are yeah. <laughs> there are places, um, and he, he spoke to this. There are places where there are concentrations. For instance, if you want helium three, you go to where the high titanium Mari basalts are, and this is a relatively small proportion of the moon. But when you start looking at the surface, it's you know millions of millions of square acres, and millions of acres. So uh, lots of territory. But it's not like we're going to mine the whole moon and it. Boy, we'd have to get way into the future, I think, before we're going to see those activities from Earth, except if you're using a powerful telescope. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, do we have another, another question Cause for uh, Mr. Dietzler? That, okay. <laughs> so we're talking about mining, but uh, what about land rights? How do we decide? <laughs> <laughs> Who owns Boy, what? That's a legal issue. I never think I know. about that sort of thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it seemed like it would be a big one. We, we actually I do figured, have a I space attorney in the room. It's a post and says, this is mine. If you try to take it away, I'll shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> So that might be a question you all could explore at lunchtime with Michelle. She's an attorney. Uh, go, uh, question over here. Okay. Once profitability becomes an issue, commercialization, how do you think that's going to go as far as globally and who's going to regulate that? I don't know. Yeah. I, I can kind of answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because we're past the mining issue and into yeah. po public policy here. Right? Yeah. So yeah. you, you can't have a law unless you can enforce a law, uh, period. Okay, period. Okay, you need a guy with a gun. Okay, and that's really what this Space Force is about. It's not just about aliens. It's not just about the satellite companies. It's about enforcing the law of, across humanity. Okay, so that there is somebody to step in. Um, when I talk to my company specifically, we talk about it as a Coast Guard. If I'm going to call out for help, I'd like to somebody to be answer there, <laughs> to, to actually answer that, right? And that's what these abilities are talking about. So governments, the, the Space Force may start out as an American thing. More than likely, all of our partners are already coming online. So this is going to be an international type event, not just a single event. Um, and that's the only way you're going to be able to enforce it. Eventually, as my daughter said, we are space cowboys and we aim to misbehave. And we are going to misbehave. Okay? You, can't, you can't stop us. There is no stopping this stuff anymore. On-demand manufacturing, the ability for a single actor on the world stage to affect the world stage, um, the ability for a single actor to take a rocket and re-enter a, a kinetic weapon onto a city. Now you've destroyed a whole city like a nuclear weapon. And you've cost the, for the cost of a small car. So this is, this is what happens when we talk about regulatories. You have to have an enforcement wing. And that's what's starting with the Space Force. It's not popular among the scientists, but if I want you to take one thing and notice, not a single politician has come out against it publicly. That's because it's already happening. You're, you're, not, you're not given a choice. It's already happening. I jump in on that yeah, one. Go ahead. So the, uh, the National Space Society do officially does not have an official opinion about the Space Force. I, 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 I double checked that before I came today. Uh, there is no official opinion from the National Space Society on that. Wait. Okay, I'm running back here. There are lots of satellites in space and lots of countries that put satellites out into space. They all have a purpose. They all have uh, different RF systems for their command and control. 
all of this needs to be regulated, and it is today in a very cooperative system between all the countries in the world. There's no there's no reason why that can't be extended to systems on the moon as well. And 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 I would. Uh, say point out that that's one of the things that the European Space Agency with their moon village concept, they're trying to have all the countries and companies of the world work together in a collaborative, cooperative way. I just wanted to put that in there. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so in, um, we have probably co uh, time for one more mining related question. Yeah. Because Dave is up here as a mining expert. Oh. Hey, Dave, if you wanted to make rocket ships to leave the moon and go out to the asteroid belt and then tap them, what metals would you do to make a rocket ship? Aluminum, titanium, some magnesium, and maybe a few small steel parts. And the moon's got pretty much titanium and aluminum. Uh, you know, you kind of want plastic. So you might have to ship some plastic up there to make your wire insulation. Ship some plastic up there and then go get some carbonaceous materials from an asteroid so you can make more. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, tapping near-Earth asteroids is eventually going to bring uh, a lot of stuff to the moon that it doesn't have now, and that will make it a lot easier in the future to do more on the moon. Okay. To follow up on that question, what would you use as a propellant on those rockets going into the asteroids? Well, they have made mixtures of aluminum powder and liquid oxygen that forms a monopropellant. You could use that, but I don't like the idea of burning aluminum, but your only other choice is to mine ice out of the polar craters and make hydrogen and oxygen and burn that. And I think some of that ice is going to have so much value in the more distant future for people living on the moon who need it for life support that we shouldn't just throw something like that away. Colleen? Um, okay, last, this will be the last okay. question. Okay. Last mining Let's question. Hey, <laughs> yeah, I get that, yeah. Okay, so um, you're, talking, you're talking about mining the moon. Is, is, uh, would mining mercury for helium-3 be, be a better option? You know, I've never read anything about that. I mean, I, I don't think, the mercury doesn't have a strong magnetic field, does it? Mm -hmm. I don't think it does. And you know, it's really dense, so it's got to be rich in heavy metals. Uh, you know, it gets pretty hot on mercury. It might roast the helium-3 right out of the regolith of mercury. I don't know. I, 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 I want to make one last comment. I'm always hearing people say, Oh, we're going to trash outer space the way we trash the Earth. And I wholeheartedly disagree because in outer space you're in an environment that's so austere that you cannot afford to waste anything. Things like a plastic bread bag are going to be worth $100. You know, every last piece of trash is worth something. It has to be recycled. So you can't have big waste dumps and landfills on other planets. Or you'd probably end up dead. So you're, you're a cash, so no wonder I don't wonder off yet. Yeah. Okay. All right, so as a, as a thank you um, to Dave, don't wander off, Dave, uh, you get to select from one, and there's four different ones, you get to be the first one to select uh, one of the Apollo coins. So this is a commemorative Apollo 40 coin. Boy, have I had these a long time in my house. Uh, uh, one from Apollo 11, 12, there's several different ones. So this is your thank you gift is one of these coins. So if you'll pick one and then, well, the rest of the speakers get to pick one later, you get first choice. So let's uh, give a round of applause to Dave for his, his hard work and, uh, and, and preparing.